Welcome to the Reality Revolution. I'm your host, Brian Scott. Today, we're going to discuss another lecture that Neville Goddard gives about imagining creates reality. Some of Neville's lectures are titled the same, but when you, when you read the lecture, they're completely different. So sometimes I want to differentiate it because I just did an episode on imagining creates reality. And I found another one with a similar title, uh, but a bunch of really good letters and, and examples and stuff that he talks about. I really enjoyed it. So we'll call it imagining fulfills itself, which is the second line in the lecture, just so I can differentiate it. And I really think you'll like this one, especially with what's going on right now. It really touched me when I read it and I couldn't wait to read it to you. Imagining fulfills itself. Neville Goddard, October 25th, 1968. Our premise is that imagining creates reality. If this is true, then imagining fulfills itself in what our life becomes. Although I have changed the words, what I have said is not new. You'll find it in the Bible. Whatever you desire, believe that you have received it, and you will. Mark eleven twenty four. That goes back 2,000 years. I could take you back another 600 years into Jeremiah to show you the same theme, the same principle. So tonight, we'll try to, to not prove it to you, but to explain it. Until these words become part of your normal, natural currency of thought, then you will not act upon it. They must become so much a part of you, it's like breathing. So you can't turn to the left or the right. You can't praise or blame anyone. If you start in life behind the eight ball, it doesn't really matter whether you start there or start in a palace whether you start as a poor little child or a very rich child, your life must actually externalize what you are imagining. If you don't know this principle, you can reproduce your environment. And if that's an unpleasant environment, reproduce it forever and forever. For you will feed your imagination upon what the senses dictate. But if you know the principle, you can ignore the present. And if the principle is true, well then, you can go all out and simply not accept the facts of life as the things on which you should feed in this world. Now, we do not observe imagining as we do objects. We are the reality which is named imagining. If you simply dwell upon it, no, I don't observe it until I become one who is awake. Then I will go along with Fawcett and Fawcett said God. That's the name he gives to the causal power of the universe. God the creator is like pure imagining in ourselves. He works in the depths of our soul, underlying all of our faculties, including perception. But he streams into our surface mind, least disguised in the form of productive fancy. So here, I can then observe him if I sit quietly and then suddenly I catch myself and say to myself, as I have said to others, a penny for your thoughts. What are you now imagining? Well then, if I am honest with myself, it may be unpleasant. But if I am honest, I know that imaginal act caused in me some motor state. Because an idea that is only an idea that is not felt produces nothing. It must be felt. It must produce motor element. 
if I am now being congratulated or I am congratulating that's a motor element if I catch myself in these moments I know what's going to happen in my world unless of course I arrest it and revise that moment but most of us aren't even aware of what we are doing and so I can almost say that we do not observe the Creator we can catch him as he streams into the surface mind least disguised in the form of productive fancy so if I know what I am doing while I ride the bus drive the car sit at home stand at a bar and someone is actually well talking to a friend and I overhear what they're saying and I instantly react but if as I react it's not just an idea but I'm reacting and I'm moving on the inside then wait it has to then fulfill itself in what my life must become this is our principle it sets every man free if he is willing to assume the responsibility because whether he assumes it or not it's working anyway and so in the end you don't sympathize you simply tell the story so that in the very end you don't condemn them you know that it's an unpleasant thing they're going through but you can tell them of a principle and let this principle work out in their lives if they accept it now we're living in a Christian world a Christian Jewish world the average person will encounter in America is either a Christian or a Jew there would be no Christians unless there were Jews for Christianity is the fulfillment of Judaism it's the climax and so you ask anyone in this world what I've asked you now do you believe that imagining creates reality the chances are that you would get a negative response they couldn't believe for a moment and yet they will tell you I am a Christian well if I am a Christian then I should accept the premise that imagining does create reality but it's new to them it hadn't as yet been repeated often enough for them to actually make it a part of their thinking but if you take them back into scripture and you read it for them in their words but even if you read it for them in their words they don't really see it they will accept it on the surface but they don't really believe it last night for instance I have never heard Billy Graham I have read what he has said in little magazines and I have read in newspapers and so I thought well now he's speaking on the second coming of Christ I'll turn him on it's such a reasonable hour 7 30 it's prime time it's a local station channel 5 it's good clear picture so I will turn him on when I turn this on I'm amazed there were thousands and thousands of people listening a thousand members in the choir and one song where he invited all the audience to stand and sing and the title of it was and they repeated the words over and over oh how I love Jesus then came Billy Graham speaking on the second coming I don't want to be critical but he hasn't the slightest concept of Jesus far less of the second coming here are thousands of people and they're talking about how they love Jesus you can't love something that you don't know they must first discover Jesus before they can love him they don't know Jesus and then at that very end comes the usual appeal I'm going to give you this book just this book you haven't asked for it and this is an interpretation of this book of the Bible and that book of the Bible as he interprets it just this book and all you have to do is send it to Billy Graham Minneapolis and then Minnesota that's a simple address that's all you do 
but said he this program that we're putting on here in Pittsburgh is costing us 500,000 and we don't have that sort of money so if you're listening and you're alone please send in a contribution if you're listening and you're not alone then take up a collection among all who are listening and send it in and here comes the pitch and this goes on night after night in a city like this for one solid week and he didn't say one word about any second coming he said if he should come now just imagine there would be no more cancer there would be no more heart failures and none of you could die his heaven is made up of flesh and blood bodies in excrementitious states yes we'd have to have bathrooms in heaven can you imagine that we'd have to of course he'd make them of gold make them of something that doesn't corrode but you'd have to have bathrooms if you're still in a body that's excrementitious so you'd have to take in food even if it was given to you don't earn it it's given to you so you have to assimilate it and what you can't assimilate you have to expel and to expel it unless you lose all sense of shame you'd have to have a bathroom well on the other hand if you don't have any sense of shame well then you revert to the animal world we all become healthy wonderful animals no heart failure no cancer and here he's talking I wondered is this 1968 is this man who when he goes to the Vatican the Pope receives him on the other hand he is equally silly concerning the mystery of Christ so why does it matter if I call it a Pope then he goes to the White House and he's entertained for lunch or dinner and he is a grand wonderful being with not one concept of the mystery of Christ now tonight we will pull this right down to the earth and show you what I really mean when I tell you that you can be exactly what you want to be in this world if you're feeling like the devil and I have felt like the devil I mean physically in the last couple of months now I'm over it but I couldn't get over the fact that when I felt like hell I was still responsible for the hell in which I found myself it wasn't in my thyroid it wasn't in my heart it wasn't in this if it was and they pinpointed it I was the cause of whatever they discovered in the heart I don't care what it is they put me through every test known in the book so I had to go back and get his report and yesterday he said to me Neville you are a dilemma know what a dilemma is a dilemma is simply that I have an argument with you and I give you two or more alternatives I give them all to you you choose any one you want and whatever you choose and you start on that assumption your conclusion will be wrong no matter what that is that's a dilemma and so I said have you stopped beating your wife take either one you want so you can choose anything that's a dilemma so I went back to him after all these tests and he said you are a dilemma your blood shows one thing and the actual test on the electrical shows the exact opposite exact opposite what he was confirming was that in my heart I know that if I don't find in the depths of my soul the cause of the phenomena of my life it is still there I'm not going to find it in any thyroid or any heart or any liver or any kidney or anything outside of myself that I know well are we big enough to face the ultimate rather than admit it can be secondary cause for a secondary cause would be the thyroid the secondary cause would be the kidney or in any organ of my body when I am wearing a body so I put myself into this body that limits me but I am the operant power of this body and it cannot become causal I am the cause and it only reflects that which I am entertaining in my imagination I must not justify it 
I must not excuse myself in any way. On the other hand, not condemn myself. So there it is. You don't feel well. Well now, you better get out of it. Don't start looking in any part of your body for it. You aren't going to find it. So you love someone and they force you through love to make all these tests. And so to please the one you love, you make all the tests. Then you come home and she says, now what's wrong? And you say, I'm a dilemma. And so I'm a dilemma. So here, I ask you to take the same full responsibility upon your shoulders and not pass the buck to the left or the right. Not to anyone, not to an organ, not to anything in this world. You can be the being that you want to be if you will take this premise that imagining creates reality. If imagining creates reality, then I must be all imagination, just as the poet said. And if the cause of all phenomenon is God, well then God is all imagination. And because I can imagine, then God the great creator must be like pure imagining in myself. I can see that. But now I must test it. I must put it to the test. It's all well and good to say it in words. But this is all new. You mean I have that responsibility? That I can by actually imagining myself what at the moment reason denies, my senses deny, everything denies, actually fulfill it and bring it to pass. Well, if the premise is right, yes. I will say to that, yes. Now, let me share with you a wonderful letter that came this week. A lady writes, my car needed repairs. So I stopped in. They examined it and they said it will cost you $62. Then I signed the credit slip. I imagined I signed a check, no credit. I signed the check and I never sign a check unless there is money in the bank to cover it that check. This was in July. August went by. September went by. And no bill from the repair. Yet I have my car. In September, a man stopped by and asked me to list his house. He wanted to sell it and was very eager to sell it. So I told him that I am not in the business anymore. But I recommended my former employer and I told him to go and see him. So he went over. Undoubtedly, he did. I didn't follow through. He went over. In October, I received a call from my former employer saying I had a referral commission waiting for me, a check. So I went over and I got a check for $68, $6 more than the amount of my car repair. Here it came, pressed down, shaken together and running over in keeping with the story in the sixth of Luke. That is like the granary when you buy grain and he shakes it all together and then he presses it down and then it runs over. This is part of the ancient world where you had a big pocket and when you bought it, you shook it down and you pressed it down until it ran over. And that's how full, like the baker's dozen. They always give you an extra bun when you buy 12 and call it a baker's dozen. Well, here she's got $6 more. And then she said, here in the beginning of September, our neighbor came down with a heart attack and he was taken to the hospital and his wife had to be there constantly. They have a little boy, John, who lives in our house all day long anyway. He and our son were playmates and they were inseparable. So we thought, well, now we'll take him in and all he'd do that he didn't do before would be to have breakfast and dinner and sleep. So at the end of five weeks, the father came out and then the mother came over to see me and she said, now, what do I owe you? I said, oh, why nothing? A haircut, maybe a dollar here, 10 cents there, maybe a quarter there. It wouldn't come to $5, so forget it. Then kiddingly, she said to this lady, of course, if at any time in the future you have an old $100 bill tucked in your purse and you don't know what to do with it, and you have no need to spend because you don't need anything, well then you could willingly pass it over, she said. That's exactly what my husband and I agreed on to give you. And from her purse, she took a hundred dollar bill and gave it. Now, she said, the story is this, before this happened, my husband and I 
decided that we have a certain chair we upholstered. We called the upholsterer. He came on in and brought his materials and we both agreed on the same pattern. He took the chair out and brought it back. It's beautiful and we love sitting in the chair and enjoy every moment of time that we look at it. But it was $87. This $100 bill paid off the $87 and gave us again another $13 pressed down, shaken together and running over. Now the story in the sixth of Luke comes after he tells you, forgive and you shall be forgiven. Verse 37. In other words, if you apply this principle towards the seeming other, for there is no other in the world and so you begin to really use it towards the good of another like job when he forgot himself in his love of friends and prayed for his friends his own captivity was lifted all that he seemingly had lost was returned a hundredfold everything that he had lost came back but multiplied a hundredfold so as you spend one minute thinking of another and representing the other to yourself as you would like them to be and persuading yourself of the reality of this imaginal act you are actually forgiving the other for what he seemed to have been to himself and to his friends you are putting him now in an entirely different state. So you're substituting your concept of him, which is a noble concept for the concept that he held of himself. That's forgiveness. Forgiveness tests the individual's ability to enter into and partake of the nature of the opposite. If I said to you as a priest, will say to someone, I forgive you, my dear, go and sin no more. But when he passes you on the street and he remembers what you confessed, he hasn't forgiven. You have to completely rub it out, completely by putting something in its place so you don't see the other. If the present Mrs. Anassas is always seen as Mrs. Kennedy, then in the eyes of the one who sees her as Mrs. Kennedy and not Mrs. Onassis, he hasn't forgotten. It's still the old pattern. She has to completely lose herself in the new affection, the new love, whatever it is, call it by any name. So you have to completely see it so much that when you see it thereafter, that's all that you see and not the former state. If you always see the former state, you are tending to pull back or pull her back into that former state. There are only states in the world. Now here is another one. My friend went to Pittsburgh this summer and visited her usual friends and her friend Betty. She grew up as a child with Betty. They discussed this and Betty loves all that Jan told her. Last summer she expressed a desire to have a new organ. She wanted a bald one. The one she'd been playing for six years. She was tired of. In fact, it was an economy model when she got it and regretted purchasing it since the day she bought it. Jan told her what to do. As you sit down to play this, you don't like, imagine it is the one you like. It's a bald one, the best you can buy and you can afford it. Even though you don't have a nickel in the bank, you have nothing in the bank, but you have the new organ. And so she began to apply what Jan told her which is only reminding her of what she knew, for she knew it because Jan had told her in previous years and wrote her and called her. So it was all exposure in the past, but now a reminder. She began to apply what Jan told her. She sat at the organ and began to play. Now her father departed this world last January and she received $4,500, but her home needed repair. So she spent the 4,500 in repairing the house then came a torrential rain and revealed the roof really should have been replaced for there were leaks in it. But that rain that came, she called the roofer and asked the roofer did not give the estimate for a while. He held up the estimate, which was $1,700. In the meanwhile, she got a check for $3,500 from her father's state and 
unexpected 3500 she said now i'll go right down immediately to the baldwin people and pick out my baldwin she went down and she picked out a five thousand dollar organ the man said to her let me show you the ad that we're now getting out it will soon break and it'll all be displayed pretty soon and the one you've picked out for five thousand dollars when it goes on sale will be four thousand one thousand will be give you on the present old organ therefore it will be three thousand dollars so she sat down and wrote the check for three thousand dollars on the day that it was installed then it comes the estimate from the roofer 1700 and she said oh why didn't he give me the estimate before i bought the bald one because it's important that i have a new roof so then she thumbed through my book the law and the promise in which there are 40 case histories but she found not one that would in any way aid her so she called jan and jan said to her there's only one principle there are 40 there but it doesn't matter if there are 60 or 1000 it would make no difference it's a principle then jan told her the story that i have told you time and time again it's not in my books of a lady in new york city this lady ann lived up the uh, ansonia at 73rd and broadway and she's a member of the oldest profession in the world a lady of the evening she came to my meetings when time allowed so this day in question i met her at broadway in 73rd and she said to me neville i want you to to ask you something all right and what is it she said i walk by a hat store and i saw this perfectly wonderful hat advertised for 1750 well i so fell in love with it i applied your principle so i took the hat in my imagination and put it on i walked up broadway feeling that i was wearing the hat on my way back i wouldn't look into the window to be disillusioned so i kept the hat on my head in my imagination when i went home still not to be disillusioned i took it off without looking into the mirror and put it on top of the shelf and then i retired well the next morning the old hat is still there but at least i had the pleasure of maybe an hour and a half of wakefulness wearing the hat now 10 days later i still haven't the hat a friend of mine called me up and said ann are you busy i said no well i'd like to see you and so ann went up to see this friend and the friend said i have something to give you i do not know what possessed me but i bought a hat and then i came home and tried it on and i wondered you must have been insane i wouldn't wear that hat to a dog fight so she brought out the hat and not a hat the hat and she said ann i think it would look lovely on you and gave ann the hat so ann said to me why didn't god give me the money to buy the hat instead of giving it to me in the way that he gave it to me through this friend i said do you feel obligated she said no i said now look i know exactly your work and we are adults and we can talk friend to friend what price hat do you usually buy now this is before the second world war and if you can go back that far may i tell you hats sold for two dollars 250 275 and three dollars and there were millions of hats at three dollars she said well i would go sometimes as high as five I said, did you ever buy a $17 hat? She said, no. I said, all right, do you owe any rent? She said, you're too nosy. I said, I'm just curious, do you owe any rent? She said, I, yes, I owe two weeks rent. I said, then you owe just about $35, don't you? She said, exactly $35. I said, now, if you looked down and you found a $100 bill while you're admiring the hat, not having ever bought a hat that expensive would you have bought the hat i said i'll answer for you no you would not have bought the hat you would have gone back to ansonia paid the 35 dollars and possibly you would have paid a week or two weeks in advance to feel free that's what you would have done and you would not have the hat now tell me Anne, how much money must god give you to get you to buy a $17 hat. If he gave you a thousand, you're not in the habit of buying $17 hats. So you'd have kept the thousand. So God knows best how to give you that hat. So he gave it to you. What are you quarreling about? And my friend Jan said to her, now that's the story. 
How much money must he give you to get you to buy the organ? You regret now having spent $3,000 for the organ because now you have the need of a new roof. And that's $1,700. Apply the same principle toward the new roof that you did towards the organ and it will not fail you. So that was this, that story. Here is a principle. She taught her how to do it. And then within a matter of moments, she forgot the source of the phenomena of life. Within a moment, she is confronted with the need of a new roof and forgot the principle that gave her the organ. Then reason comes in and says, after all, it came from your father's estate. And that may be the last from the estate. That may be the closing of the book. Reason will do it every moment of time and then take from you this divine gift that whatever you imagined that you possess, you will possess if you are faithful to the thing assumed. And that's the law. Now a lady writes me, and this is a different one, after having told what she saw here in this room of ours, after the meditation of about a week ago, it is perfectly heavenly. I won't go into it, but she said, that night I had a dream. I was in a huge, big, what seemed to be department store, and I found myself in the company of a very close, dear friend. The friend said to me, I will watch your purse for you while you go and pick out the dress that you want. Well, I went through all kinds of dresses, and I came upon a little rack of four dresses. They were cheap wool skirts, but lovely velvet blouses. And I wondered what designer would take such wonderful material and put it with such horrible skirts. Well, that is all irrelevant. That is not the single jet of truth in the dream. This is it. After shopping around, a woman came and pushed me away, and she was very rude. I then went back, and my friend is gone, and the purse is gone. A paper bag is there, but I never thought for one moment the purse is there. So I went to the sales lady, and I told the sales lady of the loss of my purse. The lady said, go back to where you left it. It may be wrapped in paper. So she went back, and there in the brown bag was her purse, she said, I do not care if the money is missing, and I had $30 in it, but I don't want to lose my personal papers because that's my identity. I wouldn't know who I am without these papers. So I went back, and I found the purse, and I took it to the sales lady, and I opened it up in her presence. Well, the $30 is gone. All my identification was there, minus one little card, and I wondered... What on earth did they find in taking that card? For they can't use it. My name is on it. And that card mentions the fact that I am an ordained unity minister. That is the central jet of truth in your dream, my dear. You have transcended. The 30 pieces of silver are very significant. The price paid for truth. 30 pieces. And you don't keep for what you buy. If I buy something, I then give something for it. 30 pieces were given, so 30 pieces were taken. You found the truth and transcended any ordination in this world as nice as unity is. All these groups are lovely groups playing their parts on certain levels of consciousness. But you are so far beyond anything that man has made for unity, Christian science, Catholicism, Episcopalianism, and all these isms are man-made doctrine. They're not based upon vision. Unity certainly is not based upon vision, neither is Christian science, nor any of these little isms. They play their parts on the level where they're found. You, in the dream, you are told you have paid the price for truth. For Christ is what one buys for truth for 30 pieces of silver, and that was taken from you. The mere fact that it was taken from the purse is what you paid for it. And, therefore, the little card giving you 
your past I would say level of consciousness has been taken too you're no longer an ordained minister you have transcended this level altogether and this is your level when you've found him you pay for him you bought him so your dream is perfectly marvelous and that which preceded it with this wonderful lake of crystal water and then these unnumbered white birds taking flight and you could feel the coolness of the morning air caused by the wings of the birds all in this room I think it's perfectly marvelous so thank you so here may I tell you you have within yourself the power to create anything in this world let things be as they are let people be what they want to be and you have your goals it doesn't matter what has happened in your world it doesn't matter what the world tells you where you started start from where you are in you is the power of the universe his name is I am and that is the Lord Christ Jesus but you'll never know it unless you test it so we are told in the 13th chapter of 2nd Corinthians verse 5 come test yourself and see do you not realize that Jesus Christ is in thee well if that challenge is given to any man if he has any red blood in him he will take the challenge I mean if anyone challenged me with don't I realize that Christ is in me I wasn't taught he was in me my mother didn't teach me that and Sunday school didn't teach me that and when I went to church as a young man a young boy in Barbados they didn't teach me that he was always on the outside always someplace in space other than myself and so I had to find him and when I found him I found that he is creative that he creates in me and my life is simply the fulfillment of my own imaginal acts I haven't always been wise in my choice of what I would imagine I have imagined the most unlovely things in this world and I have reaped them I became the fulfillment of what I was imagining for imagining is always fulfilling its imaginal state always then I began to be more alert to catch him in the process I discovered that I could catch him he would stream into my mind least disguised but he's disguised but least disguised in the form of my dream my daydream and then I'd catch him then when I could remember what dreams I entertained when I caught him and they were motive dreams motive in the sense of motion were these things making me move well then I knew what to expect unless I revised it if they were not unpleasant I didn't revise them and when I least expected it they came into being in my world so don't envy anyone in this world if this man tonight has his 500 million dollars and a girl that possibly the whole vast social world would like to have married if they could afford that marriage so he has her and when you read all this nonsense in the papers that he's a little man only 5'5 five five, so what all that envy so he's only 5'5 five five, and he's swarthy and he's this and he's that so that's his dream a dream realized in his own case and it's her dream too I've always said it I will continue to say it Blake is perfectly right he has a wonderful picture and he said more more is the cry of the fool less than all is not enough and so in scripture we have these words all thine are mine and mine are thine not some of yours you inherit God God is your possession 
So whatever God is, if I inherit him, then it's all mine. So less than all is not enough, and more, more is the cry of the fool. They are asking for more, and more, and may I tell you, as long as one wants more, he never has enough. So her income is estimated at some fabulous thing from a trust fund or trust funds of $25 million. So one paper said, well, if you had $20 million, you would think certainly that's enough, but you can adjust yourself to a way of life where it isn't enough. It just isn't enough. Let the demands made upon you from charities for this and the other, plus the fact that you're a fashion plate and you have like being a fashion plate you like being named as the best dressed of the 10 best dressed in the world. If you like that, it's going to cost you a fortune. But if you like that, it takes money to gratify that. Well, what's wrong with it? I personally have no desire to be numbered among any externally well-dressed. I hope I'm internally well-dressed. And I hope the light is blinding. I hope that garment is so powerful that they can't stand in its presence unless they are qualified to stand there. Well, if I modify it to suit the level on which they stand, that they may see the being that I represent that I am, but I certainly not on the outside. So I tell you that imagining creates reality. Believe it. It is true. So again, when Fawcett said that the secret of imagining is the greatest of all problems to the solution of which the mystic aspires for supreme power, supreme wisdom, and supreme delight lie in the far-off solution of this mystery. He knew what he was talking about. Actually, the old boy knew what he was talking about. A friend of mine sent him my book and called his attention to the chapter on revision. He also sent another copy to one who was a physicist in one of the great universities of the world. The physicist wrote back the most scathing report on the book. It's not scientifically provable, and therefore this whole thing is just trash not worthy of any part of his library. But the old gentleman who was a philosopher by profession, who taught at Oxford University, he was then in his 90s, wrote back the sweetest letter. He said, I can only say that Neville, whoever he is, I don't know, but I read the chapter in this chapter on revision. He could only have received from the brothers. No one but the divine society could have dictated this chapter. Now here was the old boy filled with praise for a chapter while the scientists rid ridiculed it beyond measure because it is something beyond his ken. He can't grasp it. You go into the laboratory and you put it together and so that's that. One day he too will sit in this place where the doctor that I saw yesterday and he too will say you're a dilemma and then you'll say to him spell it for me. Chances are he may not even be able to spell it well then define it for me i give you all these assumptions the blood says one thing the thyroid said another that one said another and if you take any premise take it you have a choice all your conclusions are going to be wrong because this is opposed to that so this is an assumption we'll come to a different conclusion and who is the riddle the one who is the dilemma but he knows whether he finds it or not all i can say to him is i feel a hundred percent better much better and you've done nothing no medication change whatsoever done nothing and i feel so much better so i can only say it is all within me whatever it is whether i pinpointed it or not what does it matter I feel better and will go blindly on until that moment in time when he says, now look, let's go and let them put it back in the dust, feed a plant with it. So I ask you to take it seriously and don't limit yourself by anything that is happening in your world now, no matter what it is. You want to be this? Well, it's what you want not what the other thinks you should want. 
What do you want in this world? Well now, conceive a scene that would imply that you have it. Persuade yourself that you have it. And then walk blindly on in that assumption as though it were true. May I tell you it will come to pass. It will not fail you if you dare to assume that you are the man, the woman that you want to be and persist in that assumption. That assumption will harden into fact. Now you may say, but I knew someone who had that assumption and she died or he died and it wasn't realized. Death does not terminate life. The world does not cease to be at that moment in time when my senses cease to register it. I am restored. The world is restored and I continue my journey. My dreams unrealized here will be realized there because I can't stop it. Imagining is creating reality. As my sister-in-law said to me when I said, there is marriage in the next world too. So you find yourself dead here, but you're not dead. You're alive and young and beautiful and altogether wonderful. Lawrence, my brother, was dying. He was making his exit from this world. And she in a very light vein said, I, I don't want to go now, but do you think that Lawrence will be waiting for me and will get married again? Well, I was off in a light vein too, and I said, God is merciful, infinitely merciful, so let it go at that. And you give it any interpretation you want to that. I have said, but just imagine two people fighting through life like cats and dogs, all on the show in one sense, and they want to perpetuate it? No, God is merciful, really is, and so you've had it. You'd have to be a stupid idiot to repeat it, to continue the nonsense until that moment in time when you're resurrected. After resurrection, there is no giving or taking in marriage. You're above the organization of sex, away beyond it. Now let us go into the silence. This lecture, Neville at the end, gets up and asks if there's any questions. And nobody asked any questions, which is unbelievable. Can you imagine a group of people had a chance to ask Neville a question? I would love to have been able to ask Neville a question. But I just thought you guys would enjoy this. It's, it's a simple teaching. And... One really interesting story that strikes out with, at me is the story of the girl that wanted the hat and she felt the hat walking around and really believing it. And the idea that she, she asks, why didn't I get the money for the hat? And he explained, you have all these other things that you'll spend your money on. And the universe is a beyond money. When you want to manifest something like a hat, like a car, oftentimes you'll have these bridge of incidents that will occur that will give you the thing that you want despite what it costs and so i'm saying test this out think big and see what happens i really thought the uh, the discussion that he has about billy graham is one of the most stark portrayals that we've seen of neville goddard really criticizing a certain form of Christianity. He does it and kind of hints at it in some other lectures. But here we can see a very direct confrontation with the ideas of Billy Graham and all of the isms in general. But it was just interesting the way that Neville interprets different dreams that people would bring to him. So... I would love to have my own inner Neville that I could discuss my dreams with. But the way that Neville discusses using the law to take care of everyday things like fixing your car or your roof, the discussions are very real world and realistic for things that I have gone through and perhaps you have gone through as well. You'll try to imagine something that's kind of a solution 
to a current problem like upholstering your chair. And it's amazing the kind of things that will come up along the way that will fix it. And it can be any number of things. So the stories that he gives here are great. I was drawn to the passage where Neville is talking about what's going on internally in his body. Obviously something's bothering him and he has to go to the doctor and that all of the tests are wrong because his heart says one thing and the something else, the electricity says something else. But I really was drawn to that and I wanted to read that to you, especially with what's going on in the world where people are starting to analyze their bodies and if they have a cough. Remember that whatever you're feeling in your body is you. And Neville is saying that even, I don't even know why, but I know that everything that's going on in my body is me. And when you take responsibility for what's happening in your body, it does give you a tremendous power over your body. Whatever you're experiencing, whatever you're feeling is your own consciousness. Please let me know if you have any similar stories. Put them in the comments. Like this video. Get this video into the algorithm because everybody in the world right now needs to know that your imagining creates reality and imagining fulfills itself. All episodes of The Reality Revolution can be found at therealityrevolution.com and welcome to the reality revolution well, well welcome to the reality revolution unlimited possibilities dedicated to the spirits who believe life is meant to be magical get out yes really good meditations and you discuss it contains advanced viewpoints of the multidimensional human beings of the 21st century i'm your host brian scott <laughs> sometimes you need to go back we were able to visualize when exploring stuff that's fun to explore i can tell unleash your potential some topics on how to change the subconscious mind and some i'm your host brian scott